as you all know, there's a great deal of lamentation these days about pernicious levels of polarization, of the country being divided, of hostile, very often norm-breaking forms of political conflict. And in response, ever more pundits, but also politicians, but also those who are sometimes rather patronizingly called ordinary people are calling for more unity, for people to rediscover what they have in common, to all come together, and to return perhaps to an age of bipartisanship as opposed to pernicious levels of partisanship. These are, of course, very, very laudable, often admirable sentiments. But in this mini lecture today, I want to complicate things a little bit and suggest that unless we properly understand the real causes of polarization, we will certainly not get to an age of more unity or discovering what we all have in common. More important still, and maybe this will sound all too negative for some of you, democracy ultimately isn't really meant to be about consensus. Its promise is not that by the end of a democratic process, we will necessarily all agree. Rather, our task, I think, is to distinguish more clearly between properly democratic forms of conflict and potentially very dangerous forms of undemocratic conflict. If we don't do that, if we, if you like, put the bar too high and essentially redefine democracy as a kind of impartial quest for the common good, I worry that we're just going to be disappointed, that we're going to be frustrated again and again and again, because our politicians, our parties will not really be able to live up to that kind of standard. But that's not in and of itself a problem, let alone the end of democracy. In a sense, we should put the bar somewhat lower, but also be clearer and more conscious about who, so to speak, clears the bar and who doesn't. So against that background, allow me to offer you three brief chapters in this mini lecture. First, let me say a couple more words about the phenomenon of polarization. Secondly, allow me to suggest to you a distinction between democratic forms of conflict and undemocratic forms of conflict. And then lastly, allow me to devote a brief chapter to the, alas, increasingly relevant question, what to do in cases where some partisan actors engage in undemocratic forms of conflict, where they break informal or sometimes even formal norms of democracy. So, polarization. Often nowadays, it's presented as if it were somehow objectively a given, a direct result of cultural differences or for those social scientists who think that psychology ought to play a larger role in explaining politics, it's even sometimes said that we're sort of hardwired for tribalism, that basically group conflict, or to put it even more poignantly, something like groups hating each other is almost inevitable in social life. But this perspective, I think, is curiously apolitical. It suggests that all these are more or less unalterable, more or less objectively givens of our social life. But if that were the case, how do we explain that other countries, some of which have cultural differences which are even larger than in the United States, and which for the most part seem to have the same kind of humans that we have around here, why don't these countries all have similar levels of polarization? So what I'm suggesting to you is that we shouldn't forget that polarization in many ways is best understood as a political project. And incidentally, if I may add, also as an economic project. Because for plenty of people, polarization has turned out to be big business. It simply is very profitable 
to rile people up about cultural differences, to endlessly repeat cliches about the allegedly unbridgeable differences between, pick your cliche, flyover country on the one hand, bi-coastal cosmopolitan elites on the other, and so on and so forth. Now, obviously, there are differences and there are disagreements, and no free society will ever be free of them, because as long as we are free, we are free to disagree, and that is in and of itself entirely legitimate and something that a well-functioning democracy can certainly deal with. The problem starts if disagreements translate into something that I would call disrespect, by which I don't mean being impolite or even you know, being insufficiently civil. Of course, it's nice to have good manners, but very often politics is, let's say, rough play without becoming unfair play. Or more specifically, it's basically a way of disagreeing without disrespect in the more precise sense I would like to suggest to you, which is basically that you deny the standing of your fellow citizens. You essentially start to suggest that they are illegitimate, that they have no real place in the polity, that they are somehow even un-American. This, in many ways, has turned out to be the political business model of what, for shorthand, I would call right-wing populists. These are actors who are not so much characterized by criticizing elites or the establishment. This, contrary to what some pundits are saying, is actually not in and of itself a terrible thing for a democracy. Uh, you may as well say it's a good sign if citizens are critical of the powerful, if they want to keep a close eye on those in Washington, D.C., and so on and so forth. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. The problem starts if right-wing populists essentially reduce all political questions, even relatively mundane policy questions, to questions of political or cultural belonging. If you essentially start to insinuate that your political opponents really have no proper place in the policy at all. I may remind you, for instance, of the president suggesting to four congresswomen that they should go back to the countries where they came from. Of course, insinuating that they had no proper standing in the polity at all. Or more recently, a tweet from Congressman Jim Jordan, who I'm quoting from memory, essentially says, Americans love America. They don't want to have their neighborhoods turn into San Francisco. In other words, a distinction is created between real Americans and apparently not everybody who has an American passport or even everybody who is sitting in Congress is necessarily a real American on the one hand. And on the other hand, people who, well, don't really belong, uh, who we don't really have to listen to because they have no proper standing in the polity. That's the kind of disrespect that is incompatible with properly conducting democratic conflict. And this kind of disrespect very often, not necessarily, but very often as a next step might lead to attempts to disenfranchise those who are said to have no proper standing in the polity, be it through voter suppression or be it through various forms of intimidation, what the feminist philosopher Kate Mann has called trickle-down aggression, where the suggestion from top political leaders is essentially that these people don't really belong, possibly pose a threat to the integrity of the country, and where those on the ground, citizens sometimes with weapons, then decide, yes, you know, this is what we're hearing, and it's fair game that we go for those who somehow pose a peril for our society. That, in essence, is the kind of difference between democratic and undemocratic forms of conducting political conflict that I want to suggest to you.
Again, I want to emphasize that this is not really about manners or civility as it's conventionally understood. It really is about a certain kind of mutual recognition of the other side's standing. It's also, by the way, about essentially accepting the democratic game in such a way that both winners and losers can expect to fight for another day. Mitch McConnell at one point observed that winners make laws and losers go home. With all due respect, I think in a democracy, it's actually a little bit different. Losers actually don't go home. Losers also sit in Congress and losers form a legitimate opposition which holds the winners accountable and which also offers systematic policy alternatives to what the winners are legitimately doing by way of lawmaking. And most important, they can sit around, if nothing else, and wait for the next election and have another chance of convincing a majority to go with them. I realize that some of this will sound very much like Civics 101. This is not new. This shouldn't really be surprising. But in an age when it's become a question whether losers will really accept the outcome of an election loss, I think it's important to emphasize that there is an important space for losers in a democracy, that democratic forms of conflict have space, not just for winners, but also for losers. Which finally brings me to my third brief chapter in this mini lecture. What to do when, let's say, one side starts to conduct conflict in an undemocratic way? What to do when one party essentially breaks norms, pushes to the limits, or sometimes even clearly beyond the limits? One answer has been to say that, well, for the sake of the greater democratic whole, one should stick to norms. One should not retaliate. One should, to put it bluntly, suffer with more or less silence. I'm not sure this is the right answer because a democracy that essentially ends up dividing the polity into, to put it uh, very bluntly and crudely and following a suggestion by the political scientist Andreas Schädler, to essentially divide the polity into scoundrels on the one hand and suckers on the other, that's not really a very good form of democracy either. So a further suggestion, in the eyes of many observers, a very problematic one, has been to remind us that game theorists, the kinds of people who you know, used to theorize nuclear warfare, uh, negotiation situations, and so on, that those theorists are pretty certain that the best way to reestablish an equilibrium is repeatedly to play what colloquially is known as tit for tat until the other side returns to a proper observation of norms. Of course, the worry about this kind of strategy has been that to, put it very bluntly again, to fight fire with fire might sometimes simply mean that your entire house burns down as opposed to actually somehow removing the particular perils or bringing other partisan actors back to some kind of game equilibrium. So how to think about this situation in perhaps a somewhat more nuanced way? I think it's important not to have a discussion that is quite so abstract. It really depends on the tat when it comes to deciding what kind of tit might possibly be appropriate. If somebody, for instance, decides that it's always a good idea to invent very insulting nicknames on Twitter, 
it's not obvious that we should tell the other side, yes, you got to basically retaliate in a sort of mechanical way and also invent a couple of nasty nicknames for your opponents. Or if one side engages in voter suppression, it's not obvious that we should say, well, the other side should also start to manipulate things. And, you know, if our voters are suppressed, then let's find ways of basically keeping their voters also out of the game. Clearly, that might indeed be the kind of downward spiral of norm violations, which ultimately leads to the destruction of democracy as a whole. So what I'm pleading for in perhaps an overly pedantic way is to more carefully think about the specific norm violations, the texture of the specific situations one is in, and to then decide in a more reflective and also sometimes more restrained way what to do. In some cases, it may well be the right thing to simply let it go and to precisely affirm that for the sake of the whole, one doesn't respond to every violation of a norm with one's own way of potentially playing unfairly. But in other situations, it really is imperative to respond with sanctions. But if one decides it is imperative, then there might be a way to make these sanctions into what, again, Andreas Schädler has helpfully referred to as democracy-preserving or maybe even democracy-enhancing sanctions, by which I mean forms of conduct that can really be justified with an appeal to underlying democratic principles, such as freedom, equality, fairness. That doesn't guarantee success. That doesn't guarantee that the other side will necessarily accept these sanctions. But as long as there is an audience, citizens, who hold on to at least some of these ideals in a meaningful way, there's at least somewhat of a chance that it's not going to be seen as mere power play. So allow me one example that's very much in the contemporary debate and that I think on one level shouldn't be too controversial. So no taxation without representation. When people push the idea that Washington DC and Puerto Rico, if people there want to go down that path, should become states, seems to me is the kind of thing that one can justify in terms of pretty general and generalizable democratic principles predicated on the underlying idea that a democratic society ultimately must be an ongoing scheme of fair play and reciprocity. Of course, as you may remember, Mitch McConnell didn't see it that way. He simply said this was a power grab by Democrats. Now, it may well be that in the short run, it has a kind of partisan payoff for one party. But to simply see it in those terms is, again, a curiously apolitical, deterministic, and in the case of the Republican Party, also curiously defeatist attitude. As I was trying to suggest to you earlier, cultural differences, political slash cultural environmental factors don't automatically determine long-term outcomes. Very much depends on what parties, partisan actors end up doing. So rather than saying, you know, particular measures are simply going to benefit one party, one may as well think, well, actually, we should just fight for these, for instance, new citizens as well. And if we fashion policies that appeal to them, then eventually we're also going to have a chance with them. And it's not simply a partisan power grab. So what I would suggest you do, if you want to think a little bit further about these issues, is to pose the question how one could fashion, how one could craft these democracy-preserving and democracy-enhancing sanctions so as not to enter a downward spiral of potentially destructive behavior. I'll leave it at that, if I may.
If uh, any of you have any questions about this, have any problems with this, want to contest what I say, tell me why I was wrong about something, I think it's not difficult to find my email somewhere on the Princeton website. So I'd be delighted to uh, enter into an email correspondence about any aspect of this. Thank you for your attention.